Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for Developer Week. I'm Arabella Santiago, and um, I've been able to put together this awesome panel of women and also our uh, um, awesome moderator, too, as well, Amy Jollymore from O'Reilly Media. Um, I just wanted to give a brief introduction to why we're doing this today, um, why do we have a women's panel, panelist of developers at Developer Week, and also give you a, a little background on some women worth knowing um, in the history of engineering and computer science. And this means a lot to me because I'm not a woman engineer, but I, I do love technology and have worked with startups and um, have been uh, a tech, technology um, fan since the days of um, uh, Roberta Williams, whose picture there, she is the, uh, she was the founder of, co-founder of Sierra Games, which did King's Quest, and when I was eight years old, I used to um, play this game all the time, and it, from the first game to the last game, the last game of the series, which was eight games. So she is, was very pro prolific, and she's definitely a, um, a, a, uh, someone who means a lot to me in, in my career. Um, and also, one of the inspirations for this panel talk uh, was uh, Megan Smith. Uh, she spoke at a, another conference a couple of weeks ago, and what she said is there is a lack of exposure to the work that technical women do. And um, as someone who's a non-engineer, I think that my skills do lend to um, helping expose the women who are making an impact in this world, and in particular today, uh, technical women, women developers and software engineers. And so this is a tribute to her talk um, a couple weeks ago. And hopefully that anybody out there um, who, who does have the power to, to help showcase women's impact in the world, that you would do so and help uh, diversify your team and also your um, anything else that you're doing. And uh, she also had introduced me to a woman, Katherine Johnson. She's 95 years old now. She was a space scientist at NASA. And she talked about how uh, um, knowing how to learn and then wanting to learn is very important and that she thinks that women and girls don't have this drive as much as they should. And uh, as women, we should want to learn even beyond college education and to have um, the ability to seek to learn more. And then this uh, Kimber Lockhart is a senior director um, of engineering at Box. Uh, she's a Stanford grad. And she talked about the imposter syndrome. Uh, there's actually a tweet uh, quoting her for this. Uh, the imposter syndrome is real. Luckily, it goes away. So um, imposter syndrome, um, I've been hearing a lot about this lately because a lot of uh, it seems that there's junior uh, developers and engineers have this and they feel that they're not um, good enough so they hide in, a, in somewhere or just run away. And I think that for women, um, this, is, this is a problem across the board regardless of whether you're a technical woman or a non-technical woman. And, um, you know, it's something that, that it's real and we should face it and, and say, you know what? we should have more confidence in our abilities and talents, whatever that is. And this is a, a Padmasri warrior. She's the CTO of Cisco Systems. She actually faced a lot of, of uh, both recognition and also criticism for the work she's done um, at Motorola. She was a CTO there for a project that failed. Um, but the interesting part is that her, how she talked about convergence um, in technology. And um, she says that she sees convergence not as technology driven, but experience driv driven. I put this in there because I think that um, you could ask any of these technical women that Building technology requires not just a technical acumen, but also the ability to understand how people use that technology. And somehow, some way, we women understand that, and we are also empathetic to users, um, the way users use technology. And putting that all together makes you a very powerful person and a very important person in a team when you're building a product. And again, Roberta Williams. So she says that throughout her career, she actually didn't face any um, problems as a woman in her field. Actually, men were fine having her on the team. Um, I think that 
just what she did say was uh, women have to do more to put themselves in the industry. So it's, it's sometimes it may not be the rest of the world. It's actually you yourself holding yourself back. And so we have to make that extra effort to do that. And that's what she said. And um, I'm sure you guys know Grace Hopper. If you don't, you should. Uh, she is a, a computer scientist and a Navy admiral. And um, there's a Grace Hopper um, foundation that does a lot of work with Google. And so um, she says, it's easier to ask for forgi forgiveness than it is to get permission. I've heard this over and over again in the startup industry. And not until I put together this slideshow today did I realize it was coming from Grace Hopper. So that was from her. Just know that. And this was a last minute addition. Thank you to Jennifer from Yahoo. I had to give it to uh, what a lot of people call or dub the mother of the internet, but Radia Perlman, she's a network engineer and uh, she works for Intel. She says, don't call me the mother of the internet. Well, um, that's just because she um, founded, what is it? Spanning tree algorithm. Spanning tree algorithm, see? I can't even say it, but hey, that's awesome because I understand that, hey, without that stuff, we couldn't have the internet, so awesome. Mother of the internet, of the internet or not, she's made an impact in everyone's lives today. And so I just wanted to say thank you and, I, and thank you to Developer Week SF for uh, giving us the opportunity to be up here and also thank you to these amazing ladies who will uh, share their experiences with you. Amy Jollymore from uh, O'Reilly Media. Okay, hey everybody. So I'm Amy Jollymore, I'm a development editor from O'Reilly Media and my job is to help authors and other talent um, focus and shape their ideas into books, blog posts, conference talks, and videos. So let me introduce the panel. Uh, first, we have Ann Ward, if you could just, <laughs> hello, is CEO Hi. of CircleClick Media, which offers SEO services, social media optimization, and PR, based in San Francisco. Ann was a web developer for 10 years, and at Apple, she was a developer designer and a beta tester of Google Analytics, analytics now being her specialty. She started CircleClick Media five years ago and now has six employees. And her clients include Heroku, Inc. Magazine, Odesk, and Tagged. I had to go old school because of my hand, so I have a lot of paper here. <laughs> Selby <laughs> is a software engineer at Versal, which helps people create interactive online courses. Prior to Versal, Selby developed and produced her own how-to videos as a YouTube partner and then leveraged her computer science degree to become a full-stack JavaScript developer. Anna Chiara Bellini. Anna is an instructor, researcher, and senior Java engineer who freelances in association with Top Tall and focuses on back-end development. She has 20 years of development experience and both her bachelor's and master's in computer engineering from the University of Bologna in Italy. And her projects vary from drone simulators to web development. Jennifer Davis. Jennifer Davis is at Yahoo and is she a senior grid production engineer. Jennifer has been with Yahoo for six and a half years and also served as its Sherpa service engineering team lead. She studied computer science at the University of Notre Dame and has been in engineering for 15 years. Okay, so Jennifer, I'm gonna start with you with the first question here. Michael Lopp, an ex-Apple guy, has said that developers get bored after about three years any place. And I'm wondering, what's it like staying somewhere longer? So you've been at Yahoo for about six and a half years. What keeps you excited and engaged and maybe a little bit about the culture there, if you could tell us. Sure, so number one, um, we solve really interesting problems at Yahoo. I've been, uh, when I first came on, I was doing uh, very high numbers of low latency for NoSQL, uh, which was Sherpa. 
and I helped architect that from scratch, which is an amazing opportunity. So first is the technical challenges that you face. Second is the actual ability to approach other teams and talk to them and learn about them. We have a very open culture uh, in that capacity and it means that for like hack days, we have hack days every quarter. I'm not sure that that's really well known, but it gives us the opportunity to try out different things, work on different teams, learn other uh, technologies from big data, which I now work on with Hadoop, to uh, things on the front end and uh, maps, everything that you can think of. So that's uh, part of it. Uh, one of the other things specifically around culture is when you look at something like Yahoo, it's not one big company. Even though that's what it looks like, it's actually like a ton of little companies and every company within that big company has its own little cultures. And we've got like the tie Tuesday, the guys that go around wearing ties. I shouldn't say guys because it's women as well. It's really awesome, that team. They're actually called DPS because they like to game as well. And uh, one of the other things that keeps me going happily at Yahoo is the fact that I don't, I don't think of it as uh, when you interview, people go to interview to find another job. I also think of interviewing as choosing your job. And so I advocate constant approaching and determining, am I doing the thing I want to do? And so that's what's kept me going. Um, basically, interview consistently and choose the job that you're at. Cool. Thank you. So, Ann Ward, you run your own company. So what kind of culture do you try to foster and model at CircleClick? Well, um, I really think work should be fun because I think if you are enjoying what you do, it always shows. So we have an open cat picture policy. Um, if you ever feel like showing me a cat picture, as long as we're not on the phone with a client, because that might get weird, but uh, we take a minute and we all look and go, oh. So we're friends, we're critical of each other, but we're always uh, supportive, and there's always time for cats. <laughs> Meow. I like so, it. Anna, um, and also Selby, if, if you want to chime in. Um, so you've worked for yourselves and freelance for quite a while. So what I'm curious about is, you know, how do you, if you do, plug into the wider community of freelancers and contract work? Uh, well, does this work? Um, the community of freelancer actually uh, is uh, um, something a, a bit um, a bit spread out. It's not like uh, you have groups of freelancer in uh, in your own town where you don't have freelancer meetups because we are sort of separate. We mo most of us work on uh, on different projects and on you know different cities. It's not like we share uh, a culture or we share um, a particular particular interests. Um, I can tell you that uh, I have lots of friends and maybe I've grown to, um, to know them, to meet them in, in time. And uh, so I have a few friends that, um, you know, we, we help each other when, um, okay, what do you think about this company? What do you think about this project? How should I handle that? Because one of the things that you miss uh, when you are a freelancer, and especially if you are working remotely or if you are working uh, alone, not in a big company, one of the things that you miss is company culture is sharing with other developers. But you get to uh, create your network of fr fellow freelancers, and you can resort to them when you have a problem, when you need to consult, like, uh, how do I handle this, or what should I do with that? And you get to confront with them. So you, you grow to build your own network of fellow freelancers. And then I might actually address the question you pointed um, to Jennifer earlier, which was, how do you keep things interesting or how do you stay engaged? And I think um, my company has been really great about giving me opportunities to switch context. So although I am a JavaScript developer predominantly, uh, recently I switched over to Scala and they were very supportive about that and it allowed me to kind of look at a different part of our stack and feel really a lot of um, responsibility and take ownership over a new portion of the technology that we're building. So I think that's a really great way to keep people engaged. That's great, thanks. Okay, so this question is for each of you. Um, I'd like to hear you talk about and share with us, in fact, to brag in detail, about one of your um, projects you're most proud of, and if, and if there were roadblocks, maybe describe those, and why it was such an important project to you. 
Okay, I'll start. Um, I think the project I remember, and I've worked on a lot of different things, but it would probably be the first project I ever did at my current job, um, which was building out an analytics dashboard. Um, predominantly because I definitely was a victim of imposter syndrome a bit, and so I was very intimidated by the process and handed a, like quite a weighty task. And I felt that I rose to the occasion, and that experience for me was really, really powerful and made me feel you know, like I could go out and do anything. So being given that responsibility at an early stage in my appointment was, was really valuable to me. Uh, the project that I was, I mean, among the recent uh, projects that I worked on, uh, the one that I loved best was uh, the drone simulator. Because, uh, you know, doing a, a simulator for drones was like, uh, I am working uh, in, uh, uh, it was a research project actually. I was uh, in, a, in a lab with uh, research engineers. Uh, uh, they were all uh, re engineers in automation and they were building the real thing. And, you know, I had to make this little figure on the screen work and move and respond to commands just like the real thing. And uh, the idea of the simulator was like, uh, oh, uh, if there is a problem in the simulator, then there is a problem in the control, and then our real thing is going to crash. So we would better find it first. Or a real drone. Yeah, yeah. a real drone. Yeah. And so uh, it was very hard because uh, it was like a completely new thing, a completely new challenge for me. Like I had been doing web development for the years before, maybe five, six years before, and this was a complete change uh, of, uh, of project and of problems. A complete change of language because uh, uh, I had to understand the language, I had to understand uh, what they meant. Uh, I mean, the domain for me was completely unknown. Uh, but in the end, it was, uh, uh, you know, very empowering because uh, I was always saying, but do you see, I have this problem. Yes, it's your simulator that doesn't work. No, I tell you, the simulator is right. <laughs> no, it's your simulator that doesn't work. And, you know, a couple of months later, when they started noticing that it, actually the drone had a problem, the real drone had a problem when it pointed in certain directions, I said, okay, come on, guys, I told you <laughs> there was a problem in the simulator. But, you know, it was really hard, really challenging, and uh, it was one year and a half project. And... You know, very hard to do, but, you know, some of the things that you say, okay, I was able to do this. Uh, and it's a real man world, that one. Like, women are like, what, what are you, a woman in this place? And, uh, you know, it, but it, I really had no problems, but it was just weird for them, probably. Uh, but in the end, it was really, really good. Cool. Nice. Um, so since this is a developer conference, I'll tell a development story. Um, my first time working at Apple was actually in college in tech support, and we had to troubleshoot a lot of wacky things in between the launch of Mac OS 9 and OS 10, which we now all know and love today. And I'm going to tell the story also because I see so many Apple logos <laughs> shining at me. Um, so it was a real pain in between that sort of OS 9, OS 10 limbo. And so if you're somebody talking to someone all day on the phone troubleshooting problems, it could be OS 9, it could be OS 10. This thing would just launch and it would just tie up your computer. Our hardware was not as good back then. So I wrote a, a JavaScript that disabled the launch of Classic so that I could troubleshoot my apps and not worry about other things launching and hanging my, my computer while I was on the phone. And it got so popular, it was used by a lot of other people uh, around Apple in my department. I got promoted, um, went off and worked for another startup and then came back. And one of the ways that I got into the position I did, which launched my career, was that they knew that script. They knew it and they were like, oh yeah, that was clutch, thanks. Because there was this month where development just couldn't get it to stop launching. So by solving a problem that I saw and being bold with sharing it, I was able to elevate my career in ways I could never have understood at the time, and it put me on a whole different path just because I was like, oh, problem, fix it. And I still do that today, so. That's awesome. Thank Thanks. You. So I have a, I'm going to tell a slightly different story. And um, my proud story actually starts with me saying I thought I was a failure. And uh, the reason is, is that, uh, no, no, it's, it's a good story, I'll, I promise you. So you, you'll see, it's, it's good. So, um, I've been at Yahoo for six and a half years, and for the first five years, I was doing, or five and a half approximately, I was doing Sherpa. And I finally left Sherpa, and I just felt like, 
oh, I failed, I left and I wasn't done because you know, it's a big project and yeah, you know what, sometimes projects are never done and you have to hand it off. And what I, I realized is that on reflection, as I look back um, and I compare what I created with Sherpa, because I joined when there was no Sherpa, um, and what I created with a team, because I'm very much a team person, is that we created this product that had really great features. There's nothing out there in the market like it um, from a NoSQL standpoint. It scales easily to other colos. We could, when a colo is getting retired, we can easily knock it down. Um, we had meta information. There's no single point of failure like with Hadoop where you have like the name node, a uh, single point of failure there. It was, and it is still an amazing uh, team uh, of, uh, with an amazing product that we built up over time, starting from that first day when I came in and I was like, well, yeah, you have to be worried about the rack uh, location and not having people have everything on the same rack and people kind of being like, oh, yeah, that's a good point. So we built up over time, I guess I should say I, <laughs> I worked with the team to define what this project was going to look like. And when I left... I left with a team that was able to support and continue supporting a product that has millions of hits a day, providing back-end storage for almost every single product that anybody uses at Yahoo. And so that's why. It starts with, I thought I was a failure when I left, but the reality was it was a really great success. And sometimes we have to recognize that you don't necessarily get everything done, but you get something done, and it is amazing. Thank you. And I, that was interesting how you switched from we to I and kind of <laughs> took that. I mean, I think there's a lesson in that for, you know, those of you who want to hear about, you know, women in IT and, and some of it is, is pushing ourselves to use a different language when describing our accomplishments. So that, that was really interesting. Thank you. In action. Um, so there are not two roles for women to play in technology. There's not just the princess or the bitch. So let's talk about how women lead. How do you each empower yourselves? You know, how do you own your own power, take charge, embrace your success, and lead as you craft your careers? How do you think about that? You're looking at me. <laughs> You're looking at me. <laughs> okay, actually, uh, there, you made me think, when you asked, when you talked about this, uh, you made me think about one peculiar re uh, situation that I lived. I was working on a project that was there for three years, and uh, I was still a freelancer, but I was working mainly in the same place. Um, there was a guy, and uh, you know, uh, there was a hierarchy of people, you know, people with more responsibilities and people with less responsibilities. And uh, uh, I had a hard time taking like, okay, I get this decision because I know it is right. Um, you often risk becoming, you know, okay, but if I brag too much, if I ask too much, then they're gonna call me bitch. Uh, it was a hard time saying, okay, I do not care what they think, I just know that this is right, and I have the responsibility, I have the role, I am going to do this. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's a moment that I think back to when uh, uh, I need to, to stand up for what I think, uh, and uh, I think this is right, so I do not care what you think. I do not care if you uh, call me a bitch, I do not need to be thought of as a princess. I know what is right, I know my, uh, my ideas, I know what I have to do. Maybe I am wrong, and this is okay. Mm -hmm. But uh, if it's my responsibility, then I will take it, and I will step up to it. And so it was like uh, this guy was uh, like saying, oh, but uh, oh, come on, you uh, overcame my decisions. And I stepped up, it was like something like taller than me. <laughs> and I looked at him and said, yes, I have the role too. And it's my responsibility, and I take it. And if I'm wrong, I am wrong. But, you know, it's, it was just the first moment when I understood that uh, I was the first one not to make it matter if I am a woman or not. Mm -hmm. That was the point. Okay, I am your superior. I take decisions. And I do not care about princess or bitch. And that was the moment. And that's the moment that I think back to when I need this kind of power. I, yes, I've had the similar moments where you sort of wrestle with, well, what do they think of me? And then I realized they're not thinking about what I'm, th they're, I'm thinking of them. Like, hello, I need to stop asking permission. I'm writing the checks here. 
Um, so something that I, I recently did was I printed business cards that said CEO because I was at a networking event with a, uh, one of my team and his card said VP business development, my card said business development. And someone thought he was my boss and my team kind of took me aside and said, uh, your card suck. <laughs> I was like, okay, fair enough. They're like, you're the CEO. And I was like, all right, well, I guess I deserve it now. So this month I printed finally, but that, that illustrates your point yeah. that um, even though I know I'm powerful and I know that I, I am an influence in, in this, this town to some degree, which all of us are, I, I couldn't own it. I couldn't fully own it until I was like a little browbeaten. <laughs> CEO. And I love, I love giving the cards out now. Love it. That is so awesome. So I have a, a slightly different uh, take on this question. And one of the things that um, I was inspired two years ago, I was at an O'Reilly conference, Velocity, and there was a woman's table. And I realized talking to these women how fortunate it was that I had had this experience to be able to reach out and talk to people because they made me realize, you know, my career is something that I am responsible for. I am responsible for leading myself. And I started really thinking about it and thinking, you know, we're all leaders or we can be. It doesn't mean that we necessarily take on that responsibility, but we are responsible for ourselves. Just like I said before with the uh, six and a half years at Yahoo and constantly interviewing, I'm choosing the company. There, for me, I am the CEO of myself, my company, which is my career. And so once I realized this, my efforts in leadership positions became much more smooth. I realized like by owning my own career, it was less about asking permission and getting people to come on board, but showing the way. And that was how I found a lot more response from my fellow coworkers, that I found people following what I did versus having to convince them to do what I wanted them to do. I love that. Your own CEO of your own, yeah, that's awesome. Um, I have not taken on leadership roles professionally, um, but I do work in a flat team structure. So I often have to kind of negotiate in a room of men um, you know, given sort of different tasks, how do we want to accomplish this? And I'm, I'm fortunate to work in a culture where the men are very, like, supportive. If I voice an opinion, I don't feel that I'm ever being read as a bitch. I'm certainly not a princess. I don't get everything I want. But I've kind of learned that I'm the only one who's going to look out for my self-interest. And if I don't speak up, um, it's not going to happen. And so... I feel really empowered in my workspace and I, and I feel fortunate because I know that there are definitely work environments where that's not the case. Um, but I do feel that it's my responsibility to seize that opportunity and speak up and kind of like was, you know, said before me, uh, don't worry too much because they're not really worrying too much. So you can't, you can't be concerned about making everyone love you all the time. Right. Yeah. It sounds a lot like a common thread here is self-concept and just deciding that you're in charge and to not worry about the, the thoughts of others that others aren't even having. So um, traditional career trajectories tend to be up, 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 like going from the trenches to the corner office. Um, so what I'm wondering is, is there a new path emerging that looks more like a series of lateral, so-called lateral moves clustered together that actually are, are equaling what is a satisfying and successful career? I mean, what are you guys seeing and, and thinking about as you, as you build your careers? So I'll take a stab at this one. I think this is a question that's really important, and I think it is something that's starting to shape itself now. A lot of companies do a really poor job in terms of providing a path of growth for engineers. You don't have to be a manager in order to uh, gain prestige. I've had interesting conversations where fellow engineers, that I'm like, you're so brilliant. And they're like, yeah, I can't wait to become a manager. And I'm like, but you would be a horrible manager because you're not a people person. <laughs> so 
Yahoo has worked really hard to do this uh, and try to frame what the path looks like, and they still haven't figured it out. It would be interesting to know about other companies that are doing this, but it's not that you want to be, as an engineer, you don't necessarily want to be an architect, right? Because an architect might be the planner person, not the doer person. And so the reality is, for me, Again, I look at it, I'm the CEO of my career. I get to choose what I want to do. And I don't care what the label is. I, I laugh about different labels. Like today, I am the ECMAScript dermatologist, apparently. So uh, that's not what I am. But um, it was very interesting. Uh, so titles, to me, don't matter. And I'm really interested to know later if you guys actually share that kind of feeling, too. For me, personally, I think defining the path is not anywhere near as important as being open to it. I started out as an HTML editor, lowly, lowly editor. I was a DBA, sysadmin, web admin. Then it was like, oh, analytics. What is this fun other thing? I could take credit for that press release I wrote. That got a lot of traffic. Oh, what is, why does this matter? Why am I not on page one of Google? This whole opening was open to me because I was pursuing what interested me. I think people here tend to float towards what interests them. And I think that's just the most amazing thing because to think I'm going to go to work, wake up one day and go to work and just make widgets or whatever and then maybe I get that big office, that just sounds like death to me. <laughs> it sounds like death to me. Because here, if you're not moving, you're dying. Like You have to continue to move and grow and learn or you're behind in even a month, at least in, in what I do. So... I, I love that, and I think it's built into living here and built into working here. I find it rather interesting that actually we have very different careers, mm -hmm. but uh, after all, we are seeing them almost in the same way. Because what I could tell you about my career is that I have I've had a very winding path. Like uh, I started working, then I went to university, then I quit university, I've been working for 10 years, and then back to university, finished, got my degree, and and then do, did some research, and then back to freelancing. And in the meantime, I've been teaching and doing several different things. So uh, it's very lateral moves, as you said. Uh, but I feel I have been growing. I feel I have been growing so much. I think I have been floating, as, as uh, Anne said, towards what mm -hmm. interests me. Yeah. Keeping myself very always interested. And if I get bored, then I call it quits. I, I'm one of those kind of people that get bored very easily. Three years is a long time to get bored. I get bored probably sooner. Uh, but, you know, uh, the good thing about, for me, about being a freelancer is uh, I really get to choose. I need some time to learn a new technology. I just take it. I just take my own time. I need the time to study. I decided that it's uh, uh, someone mentioned Scala, I think. Or uh, is it uh, analytics? Is it uh, NoSQL databases? Mm -hmm. I do not need someone to endorse me and ask me or give me permission to study it. I just do it. And uh, then I find a job. I find my way. So I think what's interesting is that we all see it it in the same way, more or less, that we are going always towards what interests us. And some women, I mean, in general, people, but me as a woman, I've, um, I am particularly sensitive to aggressiveness. If someone just l has a louder voice than me, okay, some, m most men try to, uh, to overcome by just uh, ha talking louder. We cannot compete on that. And that is stupid, but on many people, like maybe right now not, but when I was younger, for me it was a big problem. It was very easy to shut me up by just talking louder. And this is one of the things that shouldn't be done. And the other thing that, I, that really bothers me is uh, uh, stop thinking that you are at your bar. You are working. And if it is a working environment, uh, uh, you may do whatever you want when you're at the pub with your friends. It's okay. But, and I think this should be uh, the rule not only if there are women. But I guess that, uh, you know, mm, being rude or being vulgar is not for your workplace no matter if there are women or not. But if there are women, women are, and they are not going to complain. And this is very bad. I do complain a lot. I mean, uh, if, no, I do complain. Because if I feel like, okay, treating me equally is not something like, uh, okay, we do not care that you are there, so we keep doing the same things and being, I mean, I've, I will not tell you what I have witnessed because it's not, <laughs> because I'm a polite girl, but 
I mean, uh, sometimes you just have to step up and say, okay, stop doing that because it's not like we are working. And so this is something that, you know, ten, all male environments tend to degenerate sometimes. So, so be professional, as professional as possible, and, um, and not, uh, don't do like sandbox politics of bullet being bullish. Maybe. And thank you for asking that question, by the way. That's a very nice question. We have to stop. Thank you so much. You guys are great. This was a great conversation. Thanks. You can find them afterwards. Thank you. You guys are awesome.